Good morning. The scripture reading today will be from Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, and that is on page 54 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Thank you, Jared. Wow, great to see all you guys again. It was a great day yesterday. We had lots of fun with the family fusion. You got to win prizes. You got to play games. You got to lose games, in my case. But uh, that's okay. Still fun being able to play and just being able to be with, with uh, lots of other families. So if you missed it, there's always next year. So you're going to have to wait a little while. Um, We've been talking about foundations for change. It seems to be there's a whole lot of change that happens in our world. Lots of change in our government, lots of change in our society, lots of change in our culture. And it's just really hard to keep up with all of that and what's going on. It makes us nervous. It makes us say, well, stop, slow down. You can't change anything on me. And I'm not sure that's really the best approach. But I think we do need to know what are the things that don't change. What are the things that we hold on to that are there, that need to be there, and then maybe we can handle a culture and a society that changes at the speed that it does. And so the first thing we looked at is there is one God. That's it. There, there are no others. I know they think there are others. There is Mother Nature, right? Seems to be a force and power in our world. There is karma. There is luck. There is all these other things. Still not God, just things that we put names to. Make your God real. Make sure that he's not just an image or a projection that you put. Also, there's this idea that we live in God's will. We live in his power, in his word. We live by what he says. We live in the name of the Lord. So be careful how you talk about God. He notices You notice when other people talk about you and they say bad things about you, right? Take your name and uh, say all kinds of terrible things about it. You're going to notice that. It's going to make you feel something. Don't do that to God either. I mean, don't take his name in vain. Do take his name in asking. Do take his name in everything you do. Jesus tells us, you know, ask and it'll be given to you if you ask in my name. And so we have that. And I think we lose that and don't realize that as something so dependable. Because today, as in my time, and I think it really kind of started with my generation, we decided we were not going to believe any parents. We are going to rebel. We are not going to be part of the old establishment. I'm dating myself a lot here. Don't trust anyone over 30. I think I'm over 30. But there was a lot of that kind of talk going around. Today, it seems to be a lot the same of, I'm not going to take your values just because you tell me I have to. I'm going to be cynical about everything that you tell me is true. I'm going to have to prove it for myself, or you're going to have to prove it to me, or else I'm not going to believe anything. I can do what I want. It's my life. It's my body. And that seems to be the way that we look at things, and we have lost what's holy. We no longer respect anything. We no longer revere anything. We no longer think anything is important, but there has been so much abuse that has gone on, abuse in religion, abuse in families, abuse in relationships, that we no longer recognize those as even, as even being something that's important, something that we would say is worthwhile, something that we would say has great value. 
something that's holy. And if you look at the situation that we see in Exodus chapter 20, this is God giving one of the commandments on Mount Sinai. And he's already talked about the first three that we've talked about, and he says, now I want you to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's not remember the Sabbath day like remember that there is a Sabbath day. It's remember the Sabbath day, bring it to your remembrance, know that it's there, honor it. And so that's what he's really trying to say, not remember that there was one. It's like remembering I'm supposed to go to church. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's not danger of you forgetting, but it's remembering on, pers- on purpose, remembering your birthday. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You don't get any presents because, eh, I forgot. Not a big deal. He says, no, when you remember someone's birthday, you get the cake, you get the presents, you make a big deal about it, and you tease them to death about how old they are, Right? That's remembering someone's birthday. And so that's what he's saying about this. He talks about Sabbath day here. I am so glad that he picked Sabbath because what if he would picked a different day in the week? You know, I can do this one. God rested. Okay, so let's honor that day and let's rest like God rested. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad I don't have to make trees or birds or something like that. I can just imagine gluing toothpicks together, trying to say, well, we're going to make a tree today. And No, he picked the last one that talks about his creation that is part of his creation. It's complete. It's full. God sat down. And he says, this is the fullness of my creation. Everything is good. And he rested on the seventh day, and he invites us to be part of it. He says, the way that you're going to do that is by resting. I mean, do you remember the time when you were forced to take naps? Don't you wish that time came back and you could do that again and now you don't get the chance to? Well, I don't want you to get the idea that Sabbath is about taking a nap. I mean, that is not the case. That's not what he's trying to say. It is about a remembrance of a God who rested saying, It's all done. Everything is complete. And certainly we recognize everything is complete in God. He has created all things. He's above all things. He's beyond all things. And he is complete in all of his creation. It's an incredible thing. They honored it by travel distance. You can't go more than a certain distance. They honored it by not working. I mean not working at all. No work. Do it the day before, do it the day after, but no work at all. And they gave it to God, and he says, I want you to keep this holy. So how do we do that? See, some things are holy, and they should be kept holy, and we need to understand that. So remembering a day of rest is not remembering a day off. That's, that's not the point of it all. The definition of holy and what he's really trying to get at here, sometimes we talk about it as being separated for a specific purpose, and and certainly that's a general definition of it, but it also means a person or thing who is pure and devoted. And that's really what he's trying to describe here. This pure and devotion is the best meaning of this. And we usually think of a God who is holy, so he is pure and he is devoted to us. He's not just separated from sin, which he is, but he's also this concept of purity and of devotion and dedication. We talk about a holy temple. Well, why is the temple holy? Well, because we've set it apart for a time when God would be there, when God would worship. And so this whole thing is about a holy God who is good and who is pure and who is separated from this corrupt world. Basically, God is perfect. God is good. God is holy. And so much of what we see in the world is the abuse. It is the distortion. 
anything that we would call sin or wrong or anything like that is because, not because something new has been created, but because we've taken what was good and right and useful and turned it into something that is abused and now detrimental. And we see that with everything. Uh, we see that with people. We see that with relationships, with abuse that goes on. And so, therefore, we ban all those relationships. I'm never going to love anybody again. Well, it isn't love that's the problem. It's the fact that somewhere along the line it got abused and somebody didn't do something right for you. And so we abuse people. We abuse relationships. We abuse things. And so... Uh, all of those we see, they're created for a specific purpose. If I take my coffee cup in the morning and use it for a hammer, it's not going to last long. And, and, and but why not? It seems solid enough. I poured out the coffee first. Well, because it's not intended for that. It's not designed for that. That's not what it's supposed to do. You drink coffee out of a hammer, that's not going to work either. Just not going to function that way and we seem to take these misconceptions that we've been sold by society and by culture and say you need to understand that's kind of messed up that it's not going to be right it's not going to come out okay and if we get to the point where we have nothing of value nothing that is important nothing that is holy how sad because we really need to have that. We really need to honor those things. Honoring God and treating him as holy and doing what he wants is, is a lot of the way in which we treat God as holy. We find God's meaning and God's purpose in creation. We don't make it up as if, well, it's up to me. Let me decide what I want to do with his creation. It's, no, it's what did God intend in the beginning. I think sometimes we just try not to sin. That's my whole view of Christianity. I'm going to try not to do anything wrong. You ever done that? You had so many bad days, and you're just going to say, I'm just going to try to not mess up today. And sure enough, you got out of bed, and it's already broken. <laughs> I think that's the wrong focus. Because we're just concerned about what we're not going to do. We weren't trying to do anything. And so if you're trying to do something good it makes a huge difference in that yeah there might be things that that get broken or get messed up along the way but that's really not the point is it's not that we're trying to not sin we're trying to do something good we have a God who's worthy of praise and honor we want to treat him as if he's holy treat him as if he's good is there anything holy then then, then speak up then say so then sing the song then we have something to rejoice in we have a reason to be happy but if our only reason to be happy is I'm trying not to do anything wrong we don't have much of a good reason do we and so we need this value we need this holy now understand also I'm not saying that we have Sabbath day now that seems to be the one that Jesus did not repeat. He said some things are bound, some things are loosed. It was let go of. It was under the Old Testament. And I've heard people sometimes try and create a Christian Sabbath on Sunday so that they can take the nap. Sorry, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> is not repeated and if it's not repeated it's not there and it's nowhere signified that yes you are to take this day you can drive no more than three miles and you're not going to do a bit of work I mean that may be true but that's not in the Bible so we cannot use that as a command so the idea of this Sabbath day is one that is there it was found in the Old Testament we see it but certainly we want to honor God and his creation Perhaps there's not a certain day that we set aside with certain rituals, but he says we do honor God. We do learn to praise. We do learn to worship, perhaps in a whole different way. And so that's why we're here this morning, is to give this honor and this praise to God by doing what's good and by treating him as holy. But sometimes there's abuse that happens for what's holy. Matthew 7 in verse 6, 
this is just an odd statement for Jesus to make. He said, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Such an odd thing, isn't it? Well, he's just been talking about judging and how we should not be judging other people because we're going to get the same judgment back. He's not saying don't judge. He's saying you're going to get the same judgment you gave, so maybe you ought to be more lenient with everybody else. Maybe you ought to just not judge at all. And probably not your place anyway. Be careful about taking the speck out of somebody else's eye when you've got a log in your own eye. And don't throw your pearls before swine, right? It does not help the pig. No matter how gorgeous he thinks he looks, it does not help the pig. They won't appreciate him. They won't consider it as good. They will turn and attack you. And it seems like a lot of judgment in this passage after he just talked about not judging. Well, maybe sometime we ought to say, you know, some things I have to judge. This is holy. We have a God that's holy. But taking my what is holy and giving it to someone so that they can abuse it is not right. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we do it thinking it's evangelism and it's not. We're just handing it to someone to abuse our concept of God. He says, don't show it to them. Don't give it to them. Don't take what is holy for you and let someone else attack it and let someone else destroy it. Don't give it to them. Well, why not? Because it's holy. And so that's really what he's trying to say is there has to be some kind of judgment to not give what's holy to people that you know are just going to take it and tear it to bits and destroy it. He says we need to protect what's holy. We need to keep what is holy. That's really the command that I get out of this is to keep what is holy whether it's Sabbath day or whether it's Sunday or whether it's worship or whether it's your prayer time to God, whatever you designate, whatever God designates, this is holy, this is special, this is separate, this is set apart, this is pure, this is devotion. Treat that as holy and don't let somebody else make fun of it. Don't give it away. And so some things we want to keep as holy. Don't make it cheap. There's a story in 1 Samuel 4 that I'm just going to summarize for you because it's a really long, ugly story. So go back and read it later. But basically it's when the Israel and the Philistines were at battle. So they seem to always be at battle. Pick a chapter. I mean, they're always at battle, it seems like. And they got defeated. Well, they're not real happy about that, so they say, hey, I think we've got a special weapon. That special weapon that we have is so powerful, it could part the Red Sea, it parted the Jordan, it has all kinds of power about it, there's manna in it, there's Aaron's rod in it, there's the literal Ten Commandments in it. Let's go get it and let's bring it with us because surely God will be with us and we will win the battle. It was incredible. I mean, you talk about carrying something that's gold. That's, that's amazing to walk into battle with that. In fact, it scared the enemy. Like, what's that? What does it launch? They said, no, we are carrying our God who destroyed every other army but you into battle with us now. And you are about to be defeated because we brought our God. No. You carried the tabernacle, which is precious, into a battle scene. You took it out. Well, they didn't even have the Holy of Holies there yet. The tabernacle was there. The tabernacle's kind of not there. It's in transition. It's 
There, there's not a new place set up, and so they, they, the whole thinking is, well, let's just go get it. It'll be our good luck charm. It's the thing that will help us win the battle. And so sure enough, they go get it. They carry it out there. Boy, we're going to win now. You're taking something precious and holy and putting it in a situation where you could lose it. And that's exactly what happens. They lose the battle. And somebody walks off with a gold-covered box worth well, there's no price on it now. Imagine if you'd saved it. And they think they got away with it. Boy, this is great. We got the Ark of the Covenant. We got the seat where their God sits. And now their God's on our side because, hey, we got the box. You know, he's going to be on our side. Ha ha, you lose. We got the box. They're treating it like a talisman. They're treating it like a, a, a lucky rabbit's foot, like something that, that okay, now we've got this. It, it gives us luck. God can take care of himself. He doesn't have to worry about who put his box where. So the enemy's got his box, and sure enough, the first thing that happens is they get mice everywhere. And they start growing tumors everywhere well we think cancer's bad now they just started growing these tumors all over them big thing on your face big and it's not just one or two it's all of them boy you look bad today I mean can you imagine this and they're like well why is this happening to us I don't know why I got this thing on the side of my head now I got a big tumor on my arm. There's one on my foot. I'm growing them every place. I don't understand what happened. Well, we, you know, we took that box. Hmm, wonder if it could be that. And they finally decide, this isn't bringing us any luck. This is horrible. We're not winning anything here. Let's give it back. Okay? How do you give back something you won? And so they say, well, we want to give it back. How do we give it back? And they said, all right, you have to make gold mice and gold tumors. This is in the Bible. And send back with the ark. But none of you guys are supposed to carry it because it's only supposed to be carried by priests. And none of you guys are priests. So put it on a cart, put two milk cows, and send it back. And if it goes back then, okay, you'll know it was the real cause of everything. And it was. So it goes back, and Israel's like, hey, here it comes. Here's our ark. And they get the ark, and they take it to Beth Shemesh, and so it's at Beth Shemesh, and some of them get a little bit curious, you know, you want to look at it. It's supposed to sit in the Holy of Holies where no one sees but the high priest, but, you know, we want to take a look at it. Let's see what it looks like. Seventy of them died. You're not supposed to treat it like that. You're supposed to treat it as holy. And you're still not. And they say, we don't want this. Let's don't let it hang around here. Let's send it up to Kilrath J. Armin. Those guys will take anything. And so sure enough, they send the oxen on up and send it to Kilgariath J. Armin. And they're going, okay, here's the Ark of the Covenant. Uz is the one who touches it along the way and dies immediately. You know, thought it was going to fall off the cart. Don't you think God can keep it on the cart if he wants it on the cart? But he went, hey, no, I'll help you out, God. And no, he dies because nobody's treating it as holy. But Abinadab in Kilrath G. Armin says, we'll set it in a special place and I'll take one of my sons, Eliezer, and I will consecrate him to be the keeper of the ark. And it sits there for a long time. What do you do with something that's holy that no one can control, that no one can use? They don't know how, to, we've unleashed something here that we don't know how to put back in the box. And we took something's holy and we misused it and it, it's killing us. And we don't know how to get it back. 
And I think sometimes there are people in their same state today is, you know what, I've taken something that was supposed to be holy, that God set up, that God intended, that God designed, and I've treated it as if it's nothing or worse as if it's trash and I've made fun of it and I've made fun of all the people who would think it's holy and I've scorned its name and God's name and now how can I put holy back in the box? And they've got no idea how to do it. It's so powerful that no one knows what to do with it because God is behind it. God is sitting in it. Well, the thing you do with it is you treat it like it's holy. You go back to that. It's not a good luck charm. It's not something that's going to get every prayer answered for you. It's something where you treat it as holy. That's a part of your life that's core, that's basic. You need to have things about God that you treat as holy. Does he give us a list and certain requirements and say you can only go so far on what day? He doesn't do that. He says, but my things you treat as holy. And so we understand that. We understand what God wants and there's things that we need to be able to treat as holy. And then the best part of all in all of this, because this may be what he wants us to do, is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Wow. The holy is us and how you treat each other. That's holy. That comes before God so that we should be holy and blameless. And he sent Christ to die on a cross so that our sins can be forgiven, so that we can be holy and blameless. In verse 13, he talks about he gives us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. His Holy Spirit, one set apart, dedicated, special, pure devotion put into you, into your heart, so that you can understand what holy is, so that you can be able to communicate with this God, so that that Spirit communicates in ways that you don't even know how to say with that God in chapter 2 and verse 21 talks about us being built into a holy temple in the Lord. And he's talking about church. He says this is holy. We're built into a holy temple in the Lord. It's how to be holy. It's Jesus died for this in order to make this holy. Yeah, is there abuse? Is there people who don't respect church? Is there people that t treat it like trash? Is there people who treat it as if it's insignificant? Do they treat it as if it's the cause of every social problem that we've got? If we could just get rid of religion, we would all be well-adjusted. We'll worship psychiatrists. After all, they've got all the answers, right? And we lost it. And they don't get it. They don't understand. So what happens? Are they right? A lot of times they are because there is so much abuse that goes in the name of God. Just listen to the news and you're going to find a church somewhere where somebody abused somebody else and did something wrong and there's homosexuality and there's all kinds of embezzlement. And there's all kinds of things that are done that are awful in the name of God of a holy God in his holy church. So what do we do about that? We treat God as holy. We keep it holy. That was the command. Was there abuse about Sabbath day? Absolutely. There was all kinds of people who didn't keep it, didn't do it, didn't respect it, didn't honor it. 
And what does God say? Keep it holy. And when we respect the holy things of God, when we understand what those are, his church, his people, then he says, you've got the core of what a relationship with me is about. Because you can treat me as if I am holy when you respond to me. Maybe the most powerful ones in Ephesians 5, verse 25, as he talks about husbands and wives. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her. Sanctify means make her holy. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That's just an incredible passage to me. Because it compares a husband to the way Jesus treats a wife, a church. Jesus gave himself up for her that he might sanctify, make, make her holy, cleanse her, wash her, does everything to make her holy. And we need it, don't we? Goodness, so many things have gone wrong and, and that we haven't used. We need a Savior who's able to do that, but he does that in order to make us holy. Don't make fun of that. Accept the challenge. Live up to it. This is what we're supposed to be. It's a God who's trying to make his people holy with his Holy Spirit running among them. And Jesus does cleanse us, and there is a new covenant, and we understand about the washing of water with the word, and we understand about the fact that, you know, we can be baptized into Christ, we can accept this new covenant, we can have our our sins forgiven, and then we worship, and then we treat everything as if it is holy. Jesus would never allow his bride to be treated the way some of us want to treat the church. Somebody says something about your wife, what happens? He would never allow anyone to talk about his bride the way some of the people want to talk about the church. We need to treat it as holy. We need to make it holy. In fact, he's already done that, but we just need to recognize it. We need to keep it. So treat his wife with respect. Treat his wife as if she's holy. Because he's the one that makes all of that happen. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because I'm holy. That's what we do to join this holy God who has this place for us, who has this relationship with us, who is so willing to bring us there. If we'll just recognize what it is. Don't treat it as something cheap. Don't treat it as a way to get prayer answered. Well, if I come to church uh, 12 times, God, will you answer my prayer? Okay, three times. I'm not really coming 12. How about if I just tell you I'm thinking about coming? You don't make the deal. You treat what God thinks is holy as holy. And that's each other. That's the church is each other. And what a beautiful thing it is when the world looks in and goes, how in the world do you guys get along? We say, with difficulty. (laughs) But it's because we serve a holy God that we can overcome anything. And maybe you have sins today that need to be repented of. And this is your chance to be holy. Let God forgive those. We want you part of here. We want you part of us. If you need to say, I want to be part of this church, tell us that. Whatever we can do to help you in a closer relationship with God. Would you come while we stand?